noticed one or two of you uh, had arrived that I didn't see earlier. Um, so welcome, Maz. Welcome, Sharon. I'm not sure whether there was anybody else that came in. I think that's it. Okay, so we're going to partake of communion. And, you know, as a pastor, sometimes when we're doing communion, you think, oh, we've got to say the same old thing all over again. How can I make it different this time? <laughs> But we don't need to make it different, you know. We don't need to make it different because communion is communion. It's communion with Jesus. It's communion with God because we are taking bread and wine that are there to remind us of the great sacrifice Jesus gave for us. We need to bless this bread and this wine. So, Lord, I ask you to bless both parts of this communion meal. In Jesus' name. And as Jesus was with his disciples, he broke the bread. And he gave it to them and he said, take this, all of you, and eat from it. This is my body which will be given up for you. So please partake of the bread. Hmm. And that was a very chewy bit of breath. <laughs> and then he picked up the wine and he said to his disciples, this wine is a representation of my blood. Each time that you drink it, remember me. So please, Drink the wine in remembrance of Jesus. And Father God, we just thank you that you were willing to give your son away for us. You were let, willing to let him die on a cross in an horrific way the cost to you was as bad as the cost to him with the pain and the torture. But Lord, we thank you so, so much that you came to this earth, that you were willing to die on that cross just so that we human beings who are so sinful, Lord, who really don't deserve you. But you came and died on that cross for us because your love is so great. I ask, Father God, that you just bless us during this meeting. May your words speak into the hearts of all those who are listening. And may your Holy Spirit through, speak through my mouth. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, Emily. I think you've just arrived. And who else? Was somebody else arrived as well then? I can't remember. But if you if you um, have only just arrived on screen, and I haven't said hello to you, good evening and welcome. To those of you on live stream, good evening and welcome. I hope you get something out of this message tonight as well. And to those of you looking in retrospect, um, we hope that you find something of use for you. I'm sure God will speak to you in the way he knows that you need to be spoken to. That sounds rather bad, doesn't it, actually? <laughs> it sounds as if he's going to tell you off, but I'm sure he isn't. Right, so... I hope you've had a chance to look at chapters seven to nine of uh, Ecclesiastes. 
We're going to start at chapter seven, mainly because we finished at chapter six last time. So I thought seven might be a good place to start. So if we look at the first little bit of chapter seven, verses one to 14, the teacher still contrasting wisdom and foolishness. And throughout this chapter, he seems to get more and more confused. He's first for one and then he's for another. And it gets quite difficult to follow in some ways. So in, if you look at verse seven, he says a person may become foolish having once been wise, which seems a bit upside down because one would assume that one becomes wiser rather than becomes more foolish. But verse seven says, extortion turns a wise person into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. So from that, we can intimate that we can be tempted in such a way that instead of being the wise person that God wants us to be, we will become one of those foolish people who takes note of what the devil is trying to do with us rather than what God is trying to do with us. And throughout chapter seven, the teacher is wrestling with the meaning of life when ultimately everyone dies. Do you find sometimes that you do that? Do you wrestle with the meaning of life? Because I would strive to say to you that as believers, we shouldn't be wrestling with the meaning of life because the meaning of our life is to praise and glorify God, our Father, and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That is what we're here on this earth for, to shine forth for Jesus to encourage others to get to know him. But the teacher here realizes that everyone ultimately dies. And given that inevitability, he questions whether anybody can actually enjoy the things that they're given in life. It's a bit like fatalism, isn't it? We often say, oh, don't say that or else it will happen, you know. But this fatalism leads him, first of all, to form an argument that it's better to be sad than to laugh. I dispute that as well. Although you can read what he says in verses two to five, because it does everybody good to have a laugh. And then in verses 15 to 18, he questions the value of both righteousness and wisdom. But it's like everything in life, there has to be a balance. A balance between those two. The foolishness, the wisdom. And the teacher goes into quite such depth, it's almost nihilistic because he envisages a world without hope beyond the grave. So he surmises that he can only offer the advice of verse 17. And the NIV version says, when times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. And I suppose in his time, that was quite a relative statement. He didn't want to live like that. We don't want to live like that. Who wants to live through bad times only with the thought that you're going to die and that's it? And that's all these people had got. They knew they were going to die.
it, it was tough for them. It was tough even for the teacher with all his wisdom and all his knowledge to make a decision out of this righteousness, foolishness, wisdom, etc. And this verse also shows why in modern secular society that people struggle when life gets tough because they are grounded in the limitations that they have because of their mortality. The realization that there is no hope beyond those limitations is depressing. But with the resurrection of Jesus, however, our, mortal our mortality then is grounded in a greater hope. The promise of life beyond the grave and the knowledge that Christ has defeated death means that we can live differently. We are not constricted by the lack of that knowledge, thinking that when we die, we die, we'll stop. So what's the meaning of life? We have a hope. And when the teacher says, knowing that we're going to die, can we really enjoy life? Well, for us as believers, the pressure of that has gone. We don't have to enjoy every minute, enjoy every moment, because we know that we're going to enjoy it for eternity. And more importantly, we can face tragedy, we can face suffering, we can uh, face pain, we can face grief with an eternal perspective that God is ultimately bringing us into his eternal kingdom where every tear will be wiped away. And then the verses from chapter seven, verse 19, all the way through to chapter eight, verse 17, can be quite challenging because this is where the teacher really doesn't know which is which and what is what and why is why. Um, he continues with wisdom, reflecting on how it provides insight into human nature. And that's in verses 19 to 22 of chapter seven. But what he says is quite difficult to grasp because then he goes on to verses 23 and 24 and shows us that wisdom can't answer all our life and death questions because God's thoughts and control of the world are beyond us. He's not really giving us very far to go, is he? He can't decide one thing or the other. And if we read Isaiah 55 verses eight to nine, Isaiah says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's got it in control. God knows what's happening. God knows where we're at. God knows where we're going. God knows how to get us there. God controls the world beyond us. And then in verses 25 to 29, the teacher goes on to say that lack of wisdom leads to sinfulness. And then he says in verse 28 that wisdom is rare. And then in verse four, tw sorry, 29, he forces us to look at our own, our own heart. So having understood the limitations of humans, this teacher in the concluding part of chapter seven shifts his attention to the idea of mortality. 
And we see him applying his wisdom to search for a righteous person, but he can't find one. That shouldn't surprise us, should it? There is no righteous person on earth. But we as believers can stand before God in righteousness, in Christ, once we've confessed and asked for forgiveness. God created us upright. Adam and Eve had no sin. And then, and then they disobeyed God. They ate that fruit and he threw them out of the Garden of Eden. And since then, all of humanity has been born with a view to sin. Now, the people in that day hadn't got Jesus to fall back on. They could ask God for forgiveness. But because they didn't know Jesus, it was a bit more difficult for them. And as you know, a lot of them went astray. A lot of them moved away from the Lord and entered into a very sinful life. But once we've got Jesus in our hearts, the Holy Spirit is there to teach us, to mould us, to fashion us, as the scriptures say, like the potter with the clay. The teacher, you see, understood the problem of the human condition, but for him, the solution was missing because Jesus hadn't arrived on earth for the first time. So the people, the teacher, nobody knew about the sacrificial lamb who would be able to take away all our sins. We have to face the fact as human beings that when we come before the Lord to confess our sins, well, if you're like me, you don't remember anything. But as we come to confess our sins, can we honestly remember all the sins we've committed in one day? I can't. But we know God knows them all. And he, we can ask him to remember the ones that we can't remember and forgive us for those as well. But we've got that added extra in that when God forgives us, he forgives us, he forgets, we've got Jesus in our hearts and we know that we stand righteous before God in Christ. But these people hadn't got that. They didn't know about the cross and the resurrection and how it was an atonement for us. So actually this passage should make us see how blessed we are to have Jesus to rely on. And chapter eight, verses two to eight, looks at the need to obey an unjust king because of an oath of loyalty and of the reasons given for tolerating this king. I'll just read those verses to you. Bear with. It says, Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm, and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighted down by misery. Since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? And as no one has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the time of their death. God, Jesus, is our king. 
So these words are actually saying to us, obey Jesus's command. I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave his presence. Linger with him. Sit still with him. Enjoy his company. And do not stand up for a bad course, cause, sorry, for he will do whatever he pleases. You see, he knows what's right. And we don't. Sometimes we make wrong choices. And those choices, although we will get back to where we should be because God will lead us there, we shouldn't be making those bad choices. And since a king's word is supreme, how can he say to him, what are you doing? Christ is supreme. He knows everything. He knows what's going to happen. He knows where we're going to go tomorrow. He knows what we're going to do after this meeting. He is supreme. And if he's supreme, we should be obeying his commandments. We'll go on. <laughs> and then in verses 9 to 11 and verse 14, the teacher reflects on the injustice people suffer. And the questions that are raised by this. And then the in-between verses, verses 12, 13 and 15, they recognise that faith in God provides answers to the question of the meaning of life. The meaning of life is to obey God and to love God. How many times are you asked the question or have you ever been asked the question? Well, what are we on earth for? Why are we here? We're really going to die in the end. So what's the point? I can tell you I've got a daughter that says that often. At the moment, she's going to change. But that's the answer to the reason for life. We're here to glorify God, to praise God, to bring his light into the world. And we're also reminded that joy can be found in work and pleasure as long as we recognize them as God's gifts to us. Everything we have is from God. All the blessings that we've received are of God. Sometimes we think, oh, didn't I do that well? But actually, it's God working in you that makes you do it well. Because you're relying on him. And it's this word again, and you're trusting in him. So the teacher concludes that human wisdom is limited and no one can fully understand the intricacies of life except God himself. And the lack of a solution to the problem of mor morality leads the teacher to some difficult conclusions. From verse nine, it seems that he's confused over whether it's better to be righteous rather than wicked. And then in verses 12 and 13, he states that it's better to be righteous. As those who are wicked will eventually receive their due. And yes, in life, as we go through it, we often think it's very fair, unfair. But we who love God, who are believers, are often ignored whilst the wicked, the people that sin, seem to get away with it. 
but there will come a day. Remember, we have the victory. The wicked don't. We have the victory through Christ. Then in verse 14, he shows his confusion again. Is it this or is it that? And he concludes that the righteous get what the wicked deserve and vice versa. And because of that, he says, life is meaningless. It's vanity. And I hope you noticed in the second song that we sang in praise and worship that that concentrated very much on life being meaningless, life being vanity. All right, we'll move on to chapter nine. Nearly finished now. In chapter nine, the teacher goes on to explain big issues. I thought righteousness and wickedness were quite big, really. But big issues here. In verse 2, he claims that one destiny awaits everyone, whether we're good or whether we're evil, and regardless of how we live. It says, all share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful, as it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. So basically he's saying, I think, does it matter whether we're good or whether we're bad? Because we're all gonna to go to the same place. But we know we're not. We know we're not. We know that because we have accepted Jesus as our saviour and Lord, we will not, well, we will die on earth, but then we will go to paradise and be resurrected when Jesus comes again. I've lost myself now. Yes, he seems to say that there's nothing but there's no expectations of life after death. And then in verse four, he says that uh, only the living have hope. But it's not the hope that we have if we believe in Jesus Christ. We have that added hope of going on to eternal life. From your point of view, what would you think life without hope would look like? That's a question you can ponder over the week. What would life without hope look like? I think I would feel very desolate. I think it could lead to horrible mental health issues. I think it could lead to bitterness, to anger, all those negative things that we as Christians shouldn't be carrying. Praise God that we've got a hope higher than that. And yet despite this meaningless life, as he calls it, in verses 7 to 10, he says he believes it's possible to enjoy life. So he's basically saying that we should look at life in the context of God's unconditional love and acceptance. He's saying that that alone should be enough for us to enjoy life. And then from verse 13, he returns to wisdom and folly. And he describes again how they differ. And he gives an example of those at work through a story of the city under attack. And he concludes that those who shout the loudest may get noticed, even if they're foolish. Whereas wise people 
are often ignored or forgotten. So I think at the moment we have quite a confused teacher. But we have chapters 10 to 12 to come to next. Perhaps we'll see something a little bit more positive in them. But until next time, that is all I've got to say for this evening. I hope um, that what I've said has been of some benefit and help to you. For those of you on playback, we thank you very much for being with us. We're going to go into prayer and discussion now. Um, you can't take part in that on the live feed, but if you want to join us, uh, there's a, a note in on our Facebook page to give you the ID number and the passcode and everything. No, it's not. Yes, you can join us on, on Zoom. Oh, Giselle's telling me to shut up. <laughs> to those of you that, that are watching on playback, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the talk tonight and we hope to see you again soon. If you want to know more about Jesus Christ and what it is that we all go on about and rave about because of him, then please get in touch with us because believe me, he is worth knowing. He really is. You can trust him in, in him 24 seven, seven days a week, 52 weeks of the year and that's every year of the rest of your lifetime and after. He will never leave you. He's always there with you. He always listens to you. He always comes up with solutions. He blesses us oh, beyond comprehension. So if you don't know him, you're really missing out. So if you want to consider it, get in touch with us on our website which is listed below, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. But thank you for listening. Can you unmute Giselle? <laughs>